what's uh, generally speaking, I'm not going to ask financials about your company. It's not my business. But sure. generally speaking, what's the profit margin on a typical bottle of rum? It's not, uh, it's not overly big uh, because rum in general is a going to be a, a lower priced item. So we, we do have rums that we sell for 40 or 50 bucks, uh, but primarily you're looking at 20s and 30s. So uh, we have to sell it to our wholesaler and then who has to sell it to the store or the bar. And the bar is only going to pay so much for the product they plan to put in the or something. So um, I don't know, 40% or something. So it's um, it's all, it's not as much as I would like. <laughs> Right, but uh right. because you know some some you know some whiskey brands will can charge a lot because whiskey sometimes has that mystique about it um because um like garrison brothers for example they're just down the road from us make bourbon and they'll charge eighty dollars for a bottle of bourbon um so you know they have to factor in the cost of barreling and time and warehousing all that kind of stuff but they can have a much bigger profit margin because it is a whiskey so you kind of have to play with them on the grounds so if you now I, I was in the I was in Total Wine the other day mm -hmm. and I was just going through the rum section just to get more familiar with it. And I noticed there were some higher priced rums. You know, you had your fifteen, eighteen dollar bottles, then I saw some in the forties. So what mm -hmm. I was a chef for twenty seven years, so I know why a steak in this restaurant might be fifty dollars and a steak in this restaurant restaurant is twenty. Mm -hmm. But with with rum Basic, it, basically, what is going into that $40 bottle to make it cost more? Sure. So a $40 bottle of rum, usually there's an aging period on there. Uh, sometimes it's a batch size. So there are some great, Spice Run is a great example of this, right? So you think of Spice Run, you're going to think of a lot of $12 bottles of rum. Uh, just because there's a lot of expensive ones. And um, you can make a Spice Run up very cheap. You could buy mass-produced uh, neutral rum that tastes like almost like nothing, and then you can add flavorings that you buy from a flavor house. So literally, your work into that, it's not what we do, mind you, but their work into that is very minimal. So their margin can be small because you can produce a lot in very short of time. Now, if you're buying a rum like Iron for example, Iron Spice, you're going to, uh, we ferment, distill, uh, do all infusions on site. You know, we have to source all of our spices and then we have to process and make sure there's not a bunch of spices in your spice room, right? So that, you get man hours, stuff like that. So my product will be brighter and clearer and more interesting, but it's just kind of uh, the effect of um, having to do it all yourself makes it more expensive. Oh, okay. So that would be like yeah. the equivalent of wine when it says a steak bottle, which means Everything from growing the grapes, harvesting the grapes, making the wine, fermenting it, bottling, everything is done on property. Mm. And the, the thing is with, with the state bottle, it raises the price because that, well, there's more attention, personal attention required to the product, sure. but you get a much better quality control, a much better product. Exactly. And if you're okay. talking about a $40 bottle of rum, let's say uh, Zaya, might be 40, 40 bucks, 40 dollars, maybe 40 bucks even. Um, they're a big established brand, they've been around for a long time. Uh, they might have to age the barrel for five or six years. Um, so there's that time into it. Um, so that might increase the price because the warehouse would be you know, a whole running of the business kind of thing. Um, you rarely see a run that's super expensive though. Um, I usually think it's just kind of a, a volume thing. Um, I know people who have rums you can't get in Texas because Texas, sadly, the rum selection in Texas isn't as good as it could be. So you have to go to the Caribbean or another state, or um, and then you're getting rums from very small distilleries and they produce a couple thousand bottles a year. Okay. So you have to pay for that kind of thing. Yeah, like anything, if you go to a shoe store and they make all the shoes by hand, they use the best products, it'll be more expensive than getting something mass produced from Target. So, yeah, exactly. Okay, okay, I got it. Okay. So uh, how about you tell us about the, you know, just about high, you know, how, how you know, the brief history, how did it come about and, and uh, how long have you been in business, you know, w w and so on and so forth. Sure. So I, um, I told you my dad thought he wanted to open a whiskey distillery. So um, I was 23 and I didn't drink at the time. So I went from not drinking to drinking scotch. And uh, for two years, all I could drink was scotch. I, uh, it, scotch is a great way to learn barrels and barreling. Um, a lot of good information there. And eventually I met my business partner and he gave me my first gallon of molasses. I said, hey, make rum, 
skinny half of it. And I made rum and I thought it was interesting. And I decided to try rums. And so I tried some expensive rums, but they were very sugary. Because I understand back then that there's sugar. Sometimes it added back to a lot of rums. Mm. And I tried a bunch of craft rums and they were okay, but they weren't really as interesting as I thought they could be. So I decided to make the switch. I decided that rum would be a better place for me. Um, now he owns a winery in High, Texas. It's about three miles from where we are. And I met him in Dallas. So I decided to move to High to get the distillery going. And we didn't know it was going to be in High. We just thought it'd be Hill Country. But we actually got lucky enough to find a property in High. And that's why we ended up calling it High Rum. We brought in our third partner, uh, Stephanie Houston. She does a lot of our marketing, business organizations, stuff like that. Um, over the years, because we've been in business for about, uh, we've been open for three and a half years. We've been the company for four and a half. Okay. Uh, Ben's moved on because he opened another winery, so he's just so busy. Oh. Wineries are very time intensive. Uh, so her and I are just now higher off. Okay, cool, cool. Well, no, that, well, congratulations on that. And um, Thank you. I'm looking forward to trying it. Um, so what, what, now you've talked about how you do everything in house. Mm -hmm. So you have that personal attention to to the rum that you probably won't find in a lot of other rums. Is there anything about high rum that you would say is different or makes it stand out from the competition? Sure. So my uh, I say pathos, I'm not sure that's right. My uh, mode of thinking is always I like bigger flavors. Okay. Um, a lot of white rums are be completely flat, like uh -huh. a I think Cardi Superior. It's almost vodka like. Um, a lot of people go that route because it's easy to mix. I don't like that personally. I like to have bigger flavors. So I feel like a bigger rum stands up in your cocktail better. So my dark rum is huge. It has layers. I use French oak from Cabernet and Barrels. So it has a bunch of text uh, layers and depth to it. So if you want to drink it neat, you could drink it neat. If you want it in your Coke or your old fashioned, you could do that too. Same thing as spice rum. Our spice rum is potent and big in flavor. So instead of tasting like general spices, it tastes like nutmeg or cinnamon. It tastes like Christmas. So my whole goal with everything I make is to make sure I'm occupying a different uh, part of your palate. I never make the same one twice, really. Um, well, I mean, I do batches, right? So my spice from today tastes the same as next year. But I mean, like if I release a new product, I'm not gonna have spice from black pepper. You know, it's gonna be a different product. Right. It's gonna be an aged product or something like that. So. Uh, my whole uh, my train of thought is concentrate on rums and make them as best and big as possible um, so you actually enjoy them i actually get a lot of positive feedback from people from the islands who come in and try my product oh nice nice yeah. are there any um what are the possible benefits or challenges to making rum in texas because you know texas is not known as being you know rum you think of yeah. wine you think of, of steaks but you don't mm -hmm. think of rum you don't, you don't really. Um, it's interesting. It's, it's a very good question because this is what I run into a lot is everyone thinks whiskey in Texas. Yeah. Um, and there are great whiskey distilleries in Texas. I, I still love whiskey. I still enjoy whiskey here and there. Um, so the challenge is kind of going, why is a rum distillery in the middle of the country? Uh, where's the sugar cane? And our sugar comes from Louisiana. Um, because there is there is some sugar cane in Texas, but it's uh, the only one to deal with bigger volumes that we can possibly handle. So uh, yeah, that the there's a little bit of a trick of getting the molasses to us. We have to go get it ourselves because we're so small. Okay. And also uh, the customer kind of uh, marketing point is, why aren't you making whiskey? Or I get this sometimes. When's your whiskey coming out? I'm like, it's not. I'm not making whiskey. I love whiskey. I do, um, but it's not something I'm working on at all. Interesting. Okay. Well, but that's the beautiful thing about what you're doing. You being one of the, I think the, the first Texas rum I know of, at least. Uh, you're, or even if you're not, I mean, it's such sure. a small market. That's a great opportunity for you or anybody in your shoes because you can really be the one to put Texas rum on the market. I agree with you. I agree with you, Kurt. And it's a um, the thing I get people ask me all the time. You know, are you the only rum distillery in Texas? The answer is, I always say that uh, we're the only distillery focusing solely on rum. Um, there are new distilleries that have popped up that have rum, uh, but I don't know if they have a desire to make other things because I don't know everyone's plans. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, but most distilleries make a little bit of everything, um, and we're really just focused on rum here. Okay, and 
I want to make sure I, I give you props because you told me um, in in the beginning before I started mm-hmm. recording that it, it, when the pandemic started, you guys it, it made enormous amounts of sanitizer. To, yes. And you gave out, how much sanitizer did you give out? So we gave out um, 28 tons. Cool. So that, yeah, it's, um, it's a bit silly when you kind of think about it. Uh, I remember when the pandemic hit, a lot of people were saying how bored they were because they're at home. And I was working nonstop for a month straight. Um, we essentially flipped our whole business on its head. Um, 28 tons, it, is, it comes out to around 8,000 plus gallons. So, it, I mean, if you think of a little bottle, you know, of hand sanitizer, and we're, 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 we're giving away totes to police departments, hospitals, um, women's children's shelters, um, all of these things. Um, and it's one of those things that, I, I don't know, it, to me it's not a boast. I don't, it's an opportunity for me to do good. And, you know, we do give the charity otherwise, but primarily I, I make fun drinks. And um, this is something, you know, maybe once in a lifetime, an opportunity for me to do good. And, and Stephanie, she's on a call to degree, and she, she, her and I have said, hey, we're going to do this. And uh, sometimes we were a little bit of uh, ahead of the legal curve on that, uh, because a lot of laws did change, and regulations did change to make somebody able to do that. But we kind of said, you know what, we're going to do what we think is right. And hopefully uh, we don't get in too much trouble. So, um, yeah, that's just we felt like it was the right thing to do. So we went no, it was, and that's 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 fantastic. And so, not that this is how, how do you make hand sanitizer? So hand sanitizer can be made in a bunch of different ways. There's gels and liquid. Ours is a liquid hand sanitizer. We use a recipe that came from the FDA. Uh, so it's mainly alcohol, eighty percent alcohol, some uh, glycerin, and some hydrogen peroxide. Um, they wanted us to denature it with another chemical, but we decided not to, uh, just because that is harsh in our hands. Um, and we just decided it wasn't a good idea. My question is this, when you age rum, you can age it in a barrel or not in a barrel, correct? Correct. So, but generally speaking, it's aged in a barrel. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so when you age rum, Generally speaking, aging kind of mellows flavors. Does it do anything else for rum? So when you age, I um, I don't personally think it mellows flavors. So, um, and it, maybe we're just miscommunicating, which is okay. Well, I, um, well, I could also be thinking of, you know, other products too. So, and that's all, that's sure. the only thing I have a reference. So anyways, uh, let, let me start over. Let me start over. So okay. it's, uh, sure. can you please talk about how aging affects or develops flavors in the rum? Sure. So um, aging is a great way to modify your flavors. Um, obviously, if you ever had a white lightning, it doesn't taste a lot like a nice aged whiskey, right? It's a huge difference. Aging does a lot of great things. Um, if your product is harsh, it can sometimes rest it out a bit. It gives it time for the spirit to combine up with the molecules that are I mean, from, this, from the barrels themselves. If your barrel is brand new, um, it will give you a bunch of those oak flavors and vanillas. If you have a barrel that's been used, uh, let's say a bourbon cask, it will give you a lot of bourbon notes. I like uh, bourbon casks are great, but I'm a big fan of wine casks. So I use a lot of French oak wine casks. So if the French oak had the um, a cab in it, I'll get like cab notes or a white wine, I'll get like maybe brighter fruit notes. Um, the French oak always kind of give a little bit of that French spice to it. Um, so I feel like it adds a lot of flavor. Now if you have a, a weak rum or it's a very soft product, uh, a lot of those flavors get washed away. So if you over filter your rum, you're not going to taste the rum anymore, you'll taste primarily just the barrel. Um, so my rum stands up a little better uh, than other rums but you don't want to fight the barrel either. It's a, it's a fine balance. So gotcha. I feel like um, a barrel can help smooth it out and, and add a bunch more flavors depending on how you do it. Okay, so the two primary purposes in aging rum are one, to possibly smooth it out, and two, to mm-hmm. just d- develop flavors or add flavors. Yep. This is a, this is the, uh, this, it's the same reasoning for, uh, that's, how, that's why whiskey and brandy does it as well. Um, exact same thing. And with rum, when you, when you age it in a barrel, do you typically add anything to it? I do not. 
Um, there are people who have fun, and um, uh, there are some Cuban rums that throw lava in a barrel. Um, I've heard of people doing uh, vanilla in barrel and stuff like that. So um, it's definitely something you can do. It's not something I've I had a lot of work on. All my spices I've done in a tank, like a stainless steel tank. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for watching. James, thank you so much. This is uh, James Davidson, the master distiller of high rum in high Texas, which is just outside of Fredericksburg. So um, hey, again, thank you, James, and I wish you all the best. All right, cheers. Thank you.